right? I guess we are live. Yes, we are live. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second keynote talk of uh, the 13th ComSnets. And it's a great honor and privilege for me to uh, introduce Professor Jennifer Rexford from Princeton University. Uh, she's going to be talking about networks capable of change. I'm sure it's going to be rather quite exciting. Uh, Jennifer Rexford is the Gordon Y. S. Wu Professor of Engineering and the Chair of Computer Science at Princeton University. Before joining Princeton in 2005, she worked for eight years at at and Labs Research. She received her BSc degree in Electrical Engineering from Princeton University in 1991 and her PhD in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from the University of Michigan in 1996. As we all know, her research focuses on computer networking. She is a co-author of the book, Web Protocols in Practice, and co-editor of the book, She's an Engineer, Princeton Alumni Reflect. Uh, Jennifer received uh, the ACM Grace Murray, uh, Murray Hopper Award for Outstanding Young Computer Professional, the ACM Athena Lecturer Award, the NCWIT Harold and Notkin Research and Graduate Mentoring Award, the ACM SICCOM Award for Lifetime Contributions, and the IEEE Internet Award. She is an ACM Fellow, an IEEE Fellow, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and most recently, I think, the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, she's a visionary researcher and has been a great role model and a great supporter for me as well. Thank you, Jennifer, for agreeing to give this talk. Over to you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Just going to share my screen to go with you for a moment. Okay, can someone confirm that my slides are shown? Yes, I can see them. Well, thanks, Rangito. Again, it's a real pleasure to be here, even if only virtually, and I, I look forward to being able to visit again in person, hopefully soon. So the internet is really a remarkable story, a, a research experiment that within our lifetimes escaped from the lab to become a global communications infrastructure. And part of the brilliance of the early designers of the internet was their decision to have the network have a, a really simple best effort packet delivery model and to put most of the interesting functionality of the network in the programmable devices, the computers we all use every day at the edge. And from that, I think there's a, a valuable lesson that where you choose to put programmability really determines who can innovate, where they can innovate. And, and in particular, their decision lowered the barriers to innovation substantially, leading to great success for the internet. And in particular, that success has manifested itself in the diversity of those programmable devices that connect at its perimeter, as well as the diversity of applications above it and the media below it that support that, that network. But unfortunately, and perhaps ironically, the design of the internet didn't actually pave the way for its own innovation on the inside of the network. And so there the story is completely different. We've traditionally seen very heavily specified uh, st standards through long protocol standardization processes. Standards are embedded in fixed function hardware and network devices. Equipment is often closed with the hardware and software bundled together by the vendor with vendor specific configuration innovation uh, interfaces. And as a result, the number of people who can innovate uh, is quite a bit lower, mostly the equipment vendors. Even the people who own the equipment are often limited in how much they can innovate because they have to translate their, their requirements to vendors who will eventually implement those as new features. Now, I would argue this is a problem because <clears throat> the inside of the network plays an important role in determining the security of the network, its performance, its manageability, its cost effectiveness, user privacy, and so on. And so it'd be great if we had ways to, to innovate inside the internet. And in fact, as a research community, to look inward facing for a moment, we're really desperate to innovate on the inside of the network. And you can see many different efforts over many years to make packet processing in the data plane more programmable, to have uh, interfaces to the data plane from the control plane, and a lot of different control plane platforms, particularly in the software defined networking area, but even in open source router software earlier, uh, to be able to make it easier to innovate on the inside of the network. And we've also seen a diverse set of research programs uh, all over the world focusing on, in different guises, ways to make it possible to program the network, active networking, overlay networks, software-defined networking, and more, and test beds that can allow researchers to evaluate their prototypes and hopefully seed their eventual adoption. And so what I want to do in this talk is to talk a little bit about 
what what works and what doesn't when it comes to putting programmability on the inside of the network and what we or, or really what have I learned along the way. And I'm going to do this as a as a sort of retrospective on the last 25 years uh, of work in this space with a heavy focus on things I've been involved in or things I observed closely from from the outside. And the main lesson of the talk is sort of a two-pronged lesson about ambitious pragmatism, where the goal here is to lay better foundations for uh, the internet and also have them happen in practice. And so th there's a tension here between the ambition of really making things better and the pragmatism of actually having it get deployed in practice. And so I'm going to talk about two different things that sound contradictory, but I think they're both important. And one is staying in touch with reality, to do work that uses real data, creates and uses real software, deals with the challenges of real users and, and the current technology and market trends. So you can think of this as sort of changing what you can. Now, this is it's good because it allows you to get your ideas out there in practice. Of course, it's limiting in a way because changing what you can um, is often going to lead to somewhat potentially incremental change rather than really wholesale change. And so the other side of the coin is to shape future reality to enable new kinds of change, to create new artifacts, to build community, to push for the constraints that are exist today to be lifted so that it's easier to make more substantive change in the future. And I'm going to try to give examples of both types of work uh, in this talk. And as I mentioned, I'm going to focus this as a, as a 25 year retrospective, uh, showing my age perhaps. Uh, and you're going to have to humor me for a few minutes while I wax poetic about graduate school. And I know a lot of graduate students are watching right now. So I wanted to say at least a few words about the way my grad school experience is factored into what I work on now. I'll talk a bit about the time uh, I was at AT&T where the research community was working, not me, but other people on active networks to make networks more programmable, where I was focusing along with a number of colleagues at AT&T on making the management of networks more programmable. And then I'll move to, to Princeton and talk about work the community was doing at, on OpenFlow, the beginnings of software-defined networking, and talk about work on programmable control planes and more recently programmable data planes. So a lot of this work was done with with many other people, and I'm not going to call people for the most part out by name. I have a, at the end uh, have a have a bunch of slides acknowledging the the huge number of people. I never work by myself, and a lot of this work is interdisciplinary with with researchers in other fields of computer science and electrical engineering. So, by all means, this is not not only my own story. So, when I went to graduate school in 1991, uh, there was a lot of talk that Moore's law was dead. As, as you know, fast forward to today, it's now perhaps actually true. But at the time, there was a perception it was true even, even in 1991. And research on parallel computing was all the rage that we thought we need to harness multiple computers to work on bigger and harder problems to be able to get results more quickly, to predict tomorrow's weather before tomorrow. And these multi-computers had many small connected in topologies like 2D grids or toruses. And, and they, I, they, we wanted them to be able to handle very diverse workloads best effort uh, ones as well as real-time ones, and to be able to support a, a range of different applications, particularly scientific computing applications. And so in my research, I focused on programmable router hardware inside these parallel machines to have customizable routing and flow control with separate virtual networks handling each class of traffic. Now, you'll see in this talk, I'm a one-trick pony. I've been working on the same problem in, in different guises over, over 25 years, not really starting here, and in many different kinds of networks. Now, unfortunately for, for this work, uh, in many ways, the, the, my PhD work got the trends wrong. Uh, Moore's law wasn't over, or at least not yet. And the building the networks in these parallel machines wasn't really the hard part. Extracting the inherent parallelism in applications through better programming languages and better compilers proved to be the more difficult part than getting the network to work. And in fact, just as I was about to graduate from grad school, many of the parallel computing companies went bankrupt. Uh, and in fact, I have a collection of now de of mugs with the logos of now defunct parallel computing companies as sort of a little shrine uh, to to my my PhD days. Uh, now there there were other challenges too, in that it was very difficult for the research community to have real applications to try out their ideas, and the 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 chips that were available for us that when we fabricated chips uh, that we designed lagged behind the processor techno processor technology that was available commercially. And so it was very difficult to demonstrate the benefits of programmability. Now, I should say, you know, I, I, I sound like I'm bashing my, my PhD work, and, I, and in some ways I am, but I think in many ways, the, the, we're now at the point where Moore's Law is coming to an end. 
And the data centers are essentially a lot like the multi-computers that we studied 25 years ago. So perhaps I should have been more patient. I wasn't, and I moved on to, to other topics. But I just want to note that this does not mean that you know, my PhD work was a waste of time. I, I learned a lot. And you'll see many of the themes of that work pervade the, the work that I did later. So as I was halfway through grad school, the parallel computing companies were starting to go out of business and the, the web exploded. And I looked there and I saw real applications, real users, real data, people struggling to manage websites, to manage the network, and real open source software like the XKernel, which uh, Larry Peterson, who I later became colleagues with at Princeton, had developed. And I started learning about that. And I started looking particularly at asynchronous transfer mode or ATM, where the switches were actually not unlike the multi-computer routers I was working on in my PhD work. And so I started in the last couple of years of grad school to switch over, uh, pun intended, to thinking about ATM switches. And I looked at, uh, when I joined AT&T, at ATM uh, packet scheduling, packet shaping, later routing and signaling. And then later to get workloads to study over ATM networks, I started looking at IP over ATM since that was sort of the, the natural workload to carry on these networks. And then I, I like to say I transitioned to working on IP not over ATM as, as ATM and in the end didn't really make it as the, the technology that would underlie the internet. So here again, we see a second project I worked on that didn't really pan out the way I thought it would. Uh, but again, some valuable lessons learned along the way. So to evaluate our ideas, to think about how to carry IP traffic over ATM networks, we needed real traffic and real data. I remember reviewers of my papers when I would submit to conferences saying, hey, you work at AT&T, can't you get some real data to evaluate your ideas? And in the effort to collect topology, configuration, and traffic data, I realized even within AT&T, it was difficult and important to do. And I became more and more aware of the challenges facing the people that actually design and operate real networks and became fascinated by the difficulties they face and figuring out how to make their lives better. And, and finally, IP over ATM as a research area is not, not active now, but the main idea in it was that the first few packets of a data transfer, like a, an IP flow or, or TCP connection, should determine the state that gets installed in the data plane for handling the packets that follow. And you'll see in a few minutes when I talk about OpenFlow, that's exactly the same idea that's embedded in OpenFlow. And so again, here we see a lot of the ideas uh, in ATM networking, even though that technology didn't win in the end, a lot of the concepts actually carry over to, to the work that follows. So. While I was working on these topics at at and there are a number of people in the networking research community working on a topic called active networks. I wasn't involved in this at all, so I'm just going to say a few words about it from a, from a distance. So they were they were struggling with the same kind of problems that there are a lot of there's a lot of need for custom functionality inside the network as well as researchers being able to experiment. The internet had become this success that was so successful we couldn't change it anymore and it was a source of great frustration. There were a couple of different models of active networking. One the more extreme model was that packets would carry the code that the devices along the way would execute on their behalf and that was called capsules. And the other idea was programmable routers where routers would have code in them that would be invoked when packets arrived to enable really flexible functionality inside the network. And there are a lot of really interesting ideas here. I mean, the idea of programmability to enable innovation on the inside of the network, demultiplexing packets to separate software programs that act in their behalf, and the vision of a unified architecture for middle boxes. That's something we're still struggling with even, even today. But from my perspective, from at and I had sort of two questions. Uh, one was, you know, who is the programmer? Who should be programming the network? Is it really the end user or is it the network administrator? And to me, the network administrator was the user I was empathizing with. And so I was really preoccupied with that perspective. And a lot of the early work on active networking provided flexibility without good performance. Kind of like my PhD dissertation. And so I was a bit skeptical about deferring a uh, consideration of performance that it really needs to be considered uh, at the beginning. Because pragmatically, if something doesn't perform well, it doesn't matter that it's flexible in terms of practical deployment. So going back to the, the work I was doing, I started to think, well, gee, it is really great to make things programmable, but I want the user to be the network administrator and I want to think about performance and I want it to be real. So I started interacting really heavily with network administrators to understand their pain. And they had a lot of pain and not a lot of people listening to them. And so they were very happy to share war stories with me and eventually to share their data as well. And in particular, we started working in, in a whole group that was run by Albert Greenberg, 
uh, who's now, now at Microsoft, on a whole bunch of network management problems that had a similar flavor to them, where we would measure data from the network using whatever we could get, SNMP, NetFlow, our own packet monitors. We would optimize something about the network based on our observations of the traffic and the topology, and then we would change the configuration of the network accordingly, a network management control loop, if you will. And we did this to support traffic engineering, to optimize routing, to support planned maintenance without disruption, to mitigate DOS attacks, and more. Uh, but note here, the programmability is above the network. We didn't assume we could change the network hardware. We didn't actually even assume we could change the network software, because even though AT&T was a huge buyer of network equipment, they had no say over what the software on do. They could only configure it through fairly broke interfaces. And so we sort of bolted on programmability above the network taking the existing routers as a given. So I'm going to give you just one example of that flavor of work to make the, the discussion here a little bit less abstract. So we looked at traffic engineering using existing routing protocols. And at the time, AT&T and a lot of other carriers used link state routing protocols like OSPF and ISIS. And they work by having each link have a, an integer weight that the routers talk amongst themselves to exchange. And then each router computes shortest paths as a sum of those weights and directs traffic on the next hop on that shortest path. So for example, traffic entering a network on the left might take this path with weights 215 because that, that path has lower cost than any of the other paths between that ingress egress pair. So our network administrators at AT&T at the time were tuning these link weights using uh, heuristics. And whenever links were congested, they would sometimes just take, well, say, gee, this link's congested. I should just crank up its weight. And that might cause some of the traffic to move uh, to a different path because this link would no longer be on all the shortest paths it used to be on. But they were doing this in a fairly ad hoc way in the live network, uh, causing sometimes congestion and certainly transient disruptions. So we started looking at how could we help them. This, this network, um, network uh, protocol induces an optimization problem that the network administrator has to solve. Given the offered traffic, given the topology and the link capacities, what are the right link weights that would minimize network-wide congestion, say, minimize the most heavily utilized link? Now, note, this is a kind of funny problem. The routers are solving the problem of computing paths based on weights running, say, Dijkstra's algorithm. We're doing the opposite. We're trying to pick the weights that will induce the shortest paths to be the ones we actually want. And as we'll see in a moment, it's a bit of an unnatural, uh, unnatural act to, to think about it this way. It works, but it's not, not ideal. So we built a bunch of techniques for um, doing that optimization, but actually optimizing the link weights proved to be the, the easiest part of the problem. The much harder problem was actually getting the inputs and outputs together. So we needed to be able to collect the traffic matrix or infer it. And there's a, a lovely body of work uh, that people at AT&T did on, on indirect inference of the traffic matrix that, that is quite, quite statistically lovely. I also worked on more direct ways to measure it using NetFlow. And then we worked on this optimization problem, uh, collaborating with the algorithms group at AT&T. And that actually was harder than it seemed because real network protocols have a lot of peculiarities like OSPF areas and hot potato routing. So we had to model more and more complicated things. And we spent a ton of time making sure our models actually captured what the routers would really do when they were configured that way. And that was surprisingly difficult. I'll come back to that in a moment. And then finally, we, when we changed the link weights, we had to do it in ways that, that avoided transient disruptions during the change. And I just want to add one thing I did uh, when I was working on this project is I worked the night shift in AT&T's Network Operations Center for several days. I wish I'd done this earlier in my career. It was a real eye opener to actually sit side by side with the person uh, up in the middle of the night doing this work. And in particular, I learned from that, that they were, they often had inaccurate information about the network topology. They often did create transient disruptions unwittingly because of inaccurate information and often didn't really have a good way of reasoning about the network wide effects of local actions they would take. And that was quite informative for me of thinking that we really need better models and better tools to help, to help the network administrators. Um, so as we worked on that project and, and many like it, um, we began to become really concerned about what we were doing. At one level, we were doing a practical thing. We're assuming we couldn't change the data plane. All we could do is rely on the control plane to, to feed the forwarding tables or forwarding information base or access control lists. We knew that the control plane we couldn't change except by configuring. And so what we were doing was above all of this, creating more and more and more software that tried to indirectly model what the control plane was doing, that tried to coax the control plane into doing our bidding in some ways reinventing the control plane 
uh, a second time to be able to model and control it. And we began to worry that this, the end game of continuing to do this over and over and over again was going to be an ever more bloated uh, management plane. And so we started to think, is there something better we can do? Um, and I, I started chatting with people at at and who had this anxiety, and they started telling me about work in the early 80s on the telephony network, on what was called the network control point, or NCP. And there's a lovely article in the Bell Systems Technical Journal from the early 80s about this. And if you read it, it, it's, it, it feels very modern. The idea is like, wow, why don't we separate network control from network action? Why don't we have servers uh, make the control decisions and tell the network elements what to do? And if we did that, that centralization would give us greater flexibility, more scalability, uh, and more. For me, this was a, a huge eye opener. And I should say, when I worked at AT&T, it was often the case when you talk to people who worked on the old telephony network, they would have lots of skepticism about the internet and they would tell stories and you'd be like, oh gosh, another story about how great it was when in the phone network. I was often very skeptical, uh, but here I was wrong. This was actually really interesting stuff and quite relevant to the problems we were facing in, in the IP network. So the question was asked, what would this look like, this idea from the early 80s, if we were to do it inside an internet service provider backbone? And in particular, a lot of the problems we were grappling with were of a, take a form of network-wide route control, like the traffic engineering problem I mentioned earlier. But we had a problem, but the NCP folks did as well. They wanted their solution to work without having to change the equipment down below. So how are we going to do that? We don't get to change the software on the network elements. But the good thing is they do all speak standard control plane protocols. And so we use the standard control plane protocols to force the individual routers to do our direct bidding. And we called this project in a sort of homage to the NCP, we called it the RCP or routing control platform. And the idea was we would do network wide computation of the routes rather than letting the individual routers make their own decisions. And we would force the routers to take our answers by speaking to them in the protocol they know. So think of the RCP being a computer that gets all the interdomain learned routes from neighboring domains of AT&T. It computes the answer that every router should pick, and it forces it down in the router's throat by telling it only one route. So the router learns that one route and it picks it because it knows no other alternative. And that becomes the way to do network-wide route computation without requiring any changes to the routers or any changes to the way that our neighbors behave because we're still using the standard BGP protocol to, to speak to the neighbors and to the routers. Is BGP the right protocol for this purpose? Not really. It's not bad for it, but really we did this because we we're being pragmatic. Now, you might wonder, can a single computer compute the routes for an entire nationwide ISP backbone? And the answer was yes. And this was a gift from Moore's Law, in a way. Ironically, Moore's Law, can, I have a kind of love-hate relationship with Moore's Law. The, because the computers that we used were much more powerful than those on the routers that were deployed just a few years earlier. And the computations that routers make of routes, there's a lot of redundancy. Many aspects of route computation are the same on all the routers. And so we could amortize overhead by some relatively straightforward engineering decisions uh, to be able to amortize overhead. And so because a single high-end server could compute the routes for an entire backbone, dealing with fault tolerance was pretty easy. We could just use simple replication, just have multiple computers doing the same thing so that one can step in when another fails. So that was that allowed us to have a single server that could do whatever the network was already doing now. But what would be more interesting than that would be to actually do something different that the network can't do very well. And so we started looking for use cases. We wanted to make sure, again, we wanted to be pragmatic. If we wanted our ideas to get deployed, we needed to be able to demonstrate that this was actually useful. And so we looked for several use cases, frankly, across different business units at AT&T, because we wanted lots of different parts of AT&T to be clamoring for adoption. DDoS attacks, denial of service attacks were starting to be prevalent and they were really hard for the network administrators to detect and block. So we picked that as one. Virtual private networks were starting to become a major part of AT&T's business and customers were unhappy with the lack of control they had over their own routing. And so we, we looked at that. And finally, a problem we had had even earlier in our work on traffic mm -hmm. engineering was how to do maintenance without actually interrupting the ongoing applications. And I'll pick that one to just go into a bit more detail. And in particular, at the time, there was a video game called Sony EverQuest that, AT that was hosted on AT&T. And it was not uncommon that when AT&T did maintenance, the game would go offline just long enough that t tens of thousands of video game players would die at once. And so there were the, the Sony EverQuest was clamoring for AT&T to do a better job on handling maintenance events to avoid 
transient disruptions. Here, it's kind of ironic if you think about it. You're doing maintenance to make the network better, but to make it better, you have to make it disrupted for a little while, actually ironically making things worse. So this application was a great one for the routing control platform. And I'll just show you how it works. It's a really, really trivial application. And that's exactly the goal. If you have direct network-wide control, a lot of things become easier. That's exactly the point. So here's the problem. We want to take egress one uh, on the upper right down for maintenance to upgrade its operating system to maybe swap out, swap it out and put in a new router. But we've got traffic going through it. So we need to drain the traffic off that router before we take it down for, ma for maintenance. Otherwise, that traffic that's in flight is going to get dropped while the network converges to new routes. This is quite infuriating. The routing protocols will compute the new routes on their own, but you can't tell them ahead of time what you're going to do and have them pre-compute their answers. So you know what you want, but you can't tell the network to do it. The idea that we had was very simple. The routing control platform would tell the routers in the network to start using egress 2 while egress 1 is still up and carrying the packets in flight. Once the packets in flight have drained and no more traffic is going through egress 1, all the traffic will be going through egress 2, and you can safely take egress 1 down for maintenance. That's it. It's really just a matter of doing this in steps so that the network's convergence is dictated by a central entity rather than handled asynchronously by a distributed protocol. And this was deployed in AT&T's network. It was one of the first applications of the RCP. And the other two applications I mentioned were deployed as well, uh, in, in large part because we could deploy the RCP without, again, requiring any cooperation from the router vendors or the neighboring autonomous systems, and because we had compelling use cases that were able to provide immediate business value to, to parts of the company. So this is the sort of uh, pragmatic part of the ambitious pragmatism. And now I'm going to transition to stepping back a little bit. So fast forward to the academic community. And at the time, colleagues at Carnegie Mellon and Stanford, Hui Zhang at, at Carnegie Mellon and Nick McEwen at Stanford, had a really big NSF project called the 100 by 100 project. The goal being to have 100 megabit per second bandwidth to 100 million homes. And how would we do that? And Hui Zhang, as part of that, did a sabbatical at at t and he learned about our work on the RCP. And he said, you know, you guys are, are being really apologetic. You're like, oh, we can't do it the right way. We have to use BGP because we don't have a choice and we aren't allowed to change the software. We don't have a choice. And he said, you know, maybe this is the right way to control a network, even if you had the freedom to change the network devices. Maybe this is actually the answer. And he gave us a bit of courage to say, maybe let's think clean slate. If this is the right way to do things, how should we design the, the hardware and software in the network to do it? And so we came up with what we call the 4D architecture. And the picture here, you can see from the bad fonts that it's from the sort of uh, 2004, 2005 timeframe. I left it that way just for historical accuracy. Um, but basically, the three main ideas is that you want to make decisions based on network-wide visibility of the topology and traffic, network-wide objectives for what you want your network to do, and direct control so that the decisions you make get affected directly rather than indirectly through some Baroque software you don't control. And so we divided the network into a data plane that forwards packets, a discovery plane that collects and disseminates measurement data, and a decision plane that takes all that data, makes decisions, and pushes them back down to the data plane. And we call this the 4, 4D architecture. So popping up a level, that work was taking place just as I was leaving AT&T to, to go to Princeton. And I was thinking at the time that networks that are inherently easier to manage would be a great research question to revisit the work I had been doing now, assuming I can change the network, instead of bolting network management on top, how should protocols be designed so that management is inherently easier? But I was still preoccupied with wanting to make my work real and, and struggling a bit with how I would do that when I wasn't working at a company anymore, where it would be much more difficult to make it real. And I started interacting with Larry Peterson, who had, I mentioned when I was in grad school, I had been inspired by his work on the X kernel. He was now my colleague at, a, at, at Princeton. And he was at the time working on Planet Lab a distributed infrastructure for distributed systems research that supported programmable nodes with virtualization. I felt like it was grad school meets networking uh, coming, coming together. And in particular, his work was a pragmatic take on active networking. The same idea that you would have programmable routers that would demultiplex packets and handle different software for, for different sets of packets, but the interface was Linux. And, and the applications were distributed systems applications rather than low-level networking ones. So I became very inspired to think about, you know, what would this look like if we pushed it down uh, into the network? And I got involved in, in working with Larry on rethinking how Planet Lab might work 
if it was to support network architecture research rather than distributed systems work. So in parallel to all this, there was a lot of interest in the, in the US and elsewhere around a future internet design and large scale test beds for internet research. And I worked uh, quite a bit on a test bed called Genie, uh, the Global Environment for Network Innovations that was a bit like Planet Lab on steroids. And in, and in parallel to this, Nick McEwen's group at Stanford uh, started working on a project called Ethane that led to the creation of OpenFlow. And so here I'm an observer for the next next few minutes. The Ethane project at Stanford was a 4D architecture for enterprise uh, security, enterprise access control management. And they built their access controller with a, a central controller that installed rules in the data plane reactively based on the traffic. Now, they, they eventually realized that what they really needed was a way to talk to the data plane that was general. Ethane was one example of, of an application, but not the only one. And they started thinking about a general data plane that could do match action processing on packets. At the same time in industry, we were starting to see the, uh, the availability of merchant silicon chipsets from companies like Broadcom and Marvell and Intel that do packet processing. It became possible for people to build switches that don't have their own silicon foundry. And that led to a, a large number of new entrants into the, into the uh, production of, of network devices using these merchant silicon chipsets. And so the idea of having a standard interface to these devices so that you could install rules from open source software developed by researchers became really appealing. And the way these, these merchant silicon chipsets worked is you had match action tables where the match would have a rule installed where packets would be matched based on the bits in their packet header where bits could be a one, a zero, or a wildcard. And depending on which rule matched, packets would have a simple action performed on them, like forwarding out a particular output port or dropping it or sending it to offboard software for further processing. What was nice about this is you could, you could really represent routers, switches, firewalls, network address translators, load balancers, and more using the same abstraction. And for me, intellectually, what was exciting about OpenFlow is I could explain this to people who are not networking people and in particular, I started talking a lot with people in the programming languages community who found that the sort of three and four letter acronym minutia of networking quite overwhelming, but found this abstraction really clean and simple to work with. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment. So the idea then became, gee, if we had this open interface to the data plane, pragmatic because we're assuming these merchant silicon chipsets, we're not going to change them. We're just going to model them. We could have programmable control planes. And we could deploy them in our campuses and we could run experiments and even offer real services on top. And so a group of us got together, led by Nick McEwen, to write a paper on OpenFlow as a sort of call to arms uh, to get the community engaged in thinking about how to build programmable networks with programmable control planes. Now, at that time, Jonathan Smith, uh, who was at UPenn and is now at DARPA, uh, got to researchers at Princeton and Penn and Harvard and said, hey, this is a, we got an opportunity now. We can bring programming languages and networking researchers together in a way that in the active networking era, they tried but had not yet succeeded. And he was optimistic that times had changed. The needs had changed and the technology had changed. Maybe it was time to take another stab at making the network programmable. And so that introduced me to my own colleague, David Walker at, at Princeton in programming languages, indirectly introduced to me by Jonathan Smith. And we started thinking of programming abstractions for OpenFlow. And Nate Foster, who's now at Cornell, did a postdoc with us. And we started building abstractions on top of OpenFlow, learning by doing, writing lots of applications, experiencing pain, and, and reflecting on that pain and trying to have better abstractions for, for programming the network. So now for me, the user is no longer the network operator directly, but the programmer building applications in the network operator's behalf. And what we found as we did that work was that OpenFlow, for all of its good, uh, good aspects, was not a linguistic formalism. It was actually quite painful to write applications on top of OpenFlow. The good thing is all the things similar to the 4D architecture, we've got network-wide visibility, <coughs> direct control over the switches, a simple data plane abstraction, all good. But unfortunately, the interface is low level. You're thinking about match action rules and a ternary cam and bit twiddling and priorities with functionality tied to the hardware and explicit resource control around how many rules you can install and so on. And it gets worse when you try to support multiple applications, routing, load balancing, monitoring, because you have one rule table. And so you have no way to compose multiple applications together to reason about them independently and then combine them. <coughs> 
And even though we had central control, there were still lots of distributed systems challenges because the network still is fundamentally distributed. And so those were not easy to handle either. And so we started a project revisiting the control loop that I talked about earlier in the talk by now with OpenFlow as the interface instead of legacy protocols or even the RCP. Now we've got OpenFlow as the basic interface and we started developing measurement abstractions, query abstractions like SQL for asking questions about network traffic and performance, composition mechanisms to be able to combine multiple applications together to do web server load balancing followed by routing and monitoring where each of those applications could be written independently and then composed. And then finally, update abstractions for making changes to the network without disruption. And I'm not going to talk about all of these, but I'm going to talk about the last one because it'll have a nice contrast with the hitless maintenance work that we did at at and earlier. So I'll just take a moment to dwell on that. Here's the problem. You have a set of rules in your network for, for forwarding traffic. And you have a policy P1 that's installed in all the switches. And you want to transition to a new policy P2 that say forwards differently around a link you're going to do maintenance on. But you don't, you'd like the abstraction of updating the entire configuration in one fell swoop. You can't do that because the switches are distributed and they're packets in flight. But that's the abstraction you'd like. And if you had that abstraction, just to, to note, it would be actually quite nice because if you wanted to do any kind of network verification, that would become really easy. You would verify that policy P1 satisfies that property and policy P2 does as well. And then you would know that invariant always holds, even during the transition. For example, you might want to know that P1 and P2 were free of loops. But if you just update the switches asynchronously from one another, you'll go through transitions where that's not true. How do we avoid that? Well, we want to assume that there's a runtime system underneath, that the programmer doesn't have to deal with this problem, nor the, nor the network administrator. We'd like to be able to schedule the updates to the network directly using only OpenFlow commands. Something we had to do in a kind of clumsy way with the RCP, but now we can do in a much cleaner way. And the idea here is, is really simple. And again, simple is good, right? The, we, the, it, when you can work directly in a network-wide way, things that are hard become easy. And, and here's another example of that. So the basic idea is sort of like a two-phase commit. You put version numbers on packets as they enter the network. The version number corresponds to the version of the policy, and you might use, say, a VLAN tag to do that. So you stamp packets with a version number, and you forward them. First thing you do is go to the interior of the network and add new rules for the new policy to the switches that match on a new tag that you're not yet affixing on packets. Once all that's done, and you know the network has the new policy correctly installed, only then do you go to the perimeter of the network and start stamping packets with the new tag, safe in the knowledge that the entire journey this packet takes will only match against rules that have this new version number already installed. Finally, once all the packets in flight with the old version number have left the network, you can safely garbage collect, if you will, and, and remove from the switches the old rules. And so from this, you can tell that packets will either follow P1 for their entire journey or P2 for their entire journey, but never some weird hybrid of the two. Now, the way I describe this is kind of expensive. It looks like you're doubling the number of rules in the network. In practice, usually the differences between P1 and P2 are modest, and you don't have to actually double the number of rules in the network. You just have to make some smaller changes. I'm not going to go into those optimizations, but there are a whole bunch of different optimizations of this basic idea and a whole bunch of variations on what consistency properties you might want the network to actually satisfy. Uh, here I talk about a kind of extreme view where I want an entire package journey to be under one policy, but there are other models of consistency that might be weaker and others that are still stronger. So, so a lot of people worked on a, on a wide range of use cases for OpenFlow. I worked on a number of the ones that are listed here. And these use cases helped inspire both that OpenFlow is useful and to help us identify new and better programming abstractions to make these and other applications right. Now, in industry, the killer emerged from companies like Google and Nasira, which was later acquired by Nasira. And in particular, traffic engineering in private backbone networks and virtualization in multi-tenant data centers. Training and network virtualization being topics I've been interested in for a long time, but in the in the sort of large hyperscale cloud providers, they were grappling with these problems in new ways that were very different than what I'd experienced at at and t And they'd really jumped on this technology to be able to customize how they design and operate their networks. And those were, those were sort of the two uh, big early successes of, of software-defined networking in, in industry. So 
those of us involved in working on OpenFlow at the Open Networking Foundation started with a, a really simple model of OpenFlow at the beginning, a single rule table with a limited set of headers and actions that you could, headers you could match on and actions you could do, and a heavy reliance on sending packets to the controller when the switch is unable to act on its own. A lot of reactive applications were developed that way. But note that the ones that really got traction in practice didn't rely on this because sending packets to the controller is expensive and also a security, uh, security risk as well. So as OpenFlow evolved, there was more and more need to support more header fields, more actions, multiple stages of tables. And we started to see second system syndrome happening where each version of OpenFlow became more complicated, the standards documents longer and longer, and the elegance of the, of the standard was, was starting to get lost. So a bunch of us involved in OpenFlow became concerned, where does this end? I mean, are we going to ever be able to actually have an elegant abstraction for, for programming the network? This, the success of OpenFlow and yet the challenges of evolving it started to make people confident that maybe we could change the hardware. Maybe, maybe we could enable new kinds of change now that the idea of central control of networks is starting to get some traction. Maybe we should design the hardware rather than be satisfied with the hardware we have. And so folks from Nick McEwen's group at Stanford and folks at Texas Instruments designed what's called the RMT or Re Reconfigurable Match Action Table paper that was published at SIGCOMP 13. And you could think of this as kind of a active networking again, but with, a, with the pragmatism, not that you can't change the hardware, but that you still have to process packets at the link speed. You can't slow down the network to be able to get programmability. And so here there's programmable parsing, programmable match action tables, arithmetic logic units that can be programmed, and state that can be kept as packets across successive packets to do really interesting applications, yet designed in such a way that the chip area and power and bandwidth are not sacrificed to make it work. This was exciting to me, and it was sort of in many ways, finally pieces came together that we need the right hardware, the right language abstractions, and the right networking use cases. And if we can bring those three things together, uh, it's, a, it's a powerful combination. And so a group of us started working on a language for programming these devices. This time we thought, gee, when, we, when OpenFlow was worked on, the language work came later, and that was a mistake. It would have been better to design the right languages from the beginning. And so we started working with, with people in the programming languages community on designing the right language, or at least our, our first attempt at the right language. A language that would be protocol independent, that would allow you to configure a packet parser and define typed match action tables. A goal of being target independent so that you could program without knowing the switch details and have the compiler take care of compiling to the target switch. To be honest, this is a struggle still today. I don't think P4 actually achieves this goal, and I, I, I feel the pain of it in my work almost every day. And finally, reconfigurability in the field, that if you buy a, a switch that supports P4, you can reprogram it at will. Now the network operators are in charge rather than the vendors, and they can design new features without having to work with their vendors and without having to share the results with their competitors. So that was our goal with the, with the P4 language, and it's an effort that continues to this day as we continue to try to design, extend, and model the language better. So what I've been working on in this space is primarily measurement. I want to be able to get direct visibility into the details of what's going on in the network at scale. And that means analyzing, measuring and analyzing the data in place rather than relying on the central controller to do all the analysis so that we can find needles in a haystack to identify heavy hitter flows, to diagnose performance problems, or detect microbursts that might disrupt data center workloads, or detect and block attacks. And so I've been working a lot the last several years on hardware efficient data structures that work with this special kind of processor that does packet processing. I should note this is a trend. Now that Moore's Law is, is nearly over, domain-specific processors are becoming really important. And domain-specific processors in our field are these programmable packet processors, and the P4 language is our attempt at how to program them. And so I've been thinking a lot about the domain-specific algorithms and data structures that can leverage this new kind of hardware. And more generally thinking about what are the right ways to query the network to do uh, programmable, programmable switching. So if you think back to the control loop I mentioned earlier in the talk, I, I talked about measurement, analysis, and control. And now I realize that was a mistake. Those, those three steps should really be together. They're, they're actually only separate in my mind because we weren't allowed to put the functionality where it belonged. That actually measurement and analysis belong together 
directly in the data plane, right where the packets are, so that you can do the right analysis efficiently, rather than having to backhaul a lot of data or do really coarse grain approximation. And so that's been a big focus of my work recently is to combine those together. As you'll see in a moment though, the control really should be integrated with the measurement and analysis as well. And in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through this example in detail, but we return to the idea of how to do traffic engineering. But now with central policies stated in the, uh, above the network, but compiled to device local programs that run directly in the switches. In some ways, recapitulating the idea of central control and saying what we actually want is a central statement of the policies for the network. And we should put the functionality where it belongs. If it belongs in the switches, so be it. But the, but the key point is that we actually want to be able to state the policies in a centralized way under the assumption we see what we need to see and then implement it as efficiently as we can. In the interest of time, I won't go into detail about that. So in closing, I, be, I now see what we really want is to move from separate abstractions for the different parts of the network control loop, measurement, analysis, and optimization and control, to a better integration of those three steps. To start with network-wide goals and network-wide constraints that go through a compiler to, de to generate the device local programs that put the functionality where it belongs and as low in the stack as it needs to be. Now, there's a lot of talk in industry right now about intent-based network management. And at some level, that's actually what I'm saying. It's not a, not a new idea at all. I think the only thing that's interesting here is that I believe to do intent-based networking right, that you need to have a programmable network so that you can directly implement your intent rather than having to go through bloated, convoluted software to try to coax the network into doing your bidding. And so I'm excited about the emergence now of programmable network hardware and languages and abstractions on top of that that can let us achieve that, that sort of wish list that we've had for so many years. So stepping back over, myself and many others have been trying to make the network programmable, starting by thinking about programmable management planes. Once that was sort of well in hand, having the courage to try to change the control plane. And then finally, with that in hand, being able to change the network hardware to actually be designed with management and control in mind from the beginning. So it's been a long struggle, but we're making great progress, I think, over many, many years by counterbalancing ambition and pragmatism while keeping our eye on the prize. So I just want to say a few words at the end about lessons learned. I, I think for me, identifying compelling use cases has always been a great motivator for my work. And in particular, if there's somebody struggling, whether it's a network administrator or a programmer, uh, there's often interesting research to do because if they're struggling, that means that their intent and their reality are separated by technology that's getting in the way. And so we should be looking for ways to, to help them out of that. Another is, is interdisciplinary collaboration. I've had and networking is not really in many ways its own academic discipline. It's a really big, hairy mess of multifaceted problems and technical constraints. And, and the, if we can draw people in from all these other areas of computer science and electrical engineering and more, we can really make progress on these big, hairy problems. And also hopefully lay some interesting intellectual foundations in those fields as well. And so I've benefited greatly from those collaborations with colleagues in, in a whole bunch of different areas. And I hope they've benefited too in seeing their concepts and ideas see the light of day in what is arguably one of the most important artifacts in our society, the, the internet. And finally, I just say it's, I know I'm going to sound like an old fogey, but knowing your history is really useful. I found that, you know, a lot of ideas come around multiple times. Active networks did. Even this early 80s work on the telephony network did. Different kinds of networks, parallel computers, ATM networks, phone networks, uh, a lot of these ideas come around and around again with different constraints and different opportunities. And so it's useful to know some history to sometimes you can reinvent the wheel in, in new ways because the timing is right. And finally, I'll just say, uh, the, again, the two-pronged lesson of this talk at one level is to don't fight what you can't change so that you can make progress today. In the RCP work, we assumed we couldn't change the control plane of the network. So we built the RCP assuming we couldn't change it. In the open flow work, we assumed we couldn't change the hardware, but we could change the interface to it. And then finally, we assumed we could change the hardware, but we couldn't sacrifice performance and chip area in doing it. But of course, we want to enable new kinds of change so that the constraints we operate under get, get more and more relaxed over time. And to do that, I think we're, we're best working together to build and deploy and share our prototypes, to write, to write visions down and try to get others excited about our vision, to hone our vision so that they're a collective vision, not just for one researcher, but for a community of researchers. And to foster community 
through you know organization of conferences like this one, uh, standards bodies, giving tutorials, uh, and more. We're stronger together than, than we are apart. And so I'd just like to, to thank my many collaborators and colleagues, particularly my, uh, my advisor in grad school and my, my mentor at AT&T and other people I've collaborated with. But there are a ton of people involved in the different projects I mentioned and in the projects that I wasn't involved in that inspired me along the way. And also I'd like to thank my research group at Princeton, who obviously played a huge role in, in uh, building and, and executing on this vision. And I'll stop here and be happy to, to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Jen, for that fabulous talk. It's uh, not just the content, but also the flow and just to see how your thought process has changed and evolved over the many uh, years is, is really amazing. Uh, we have some questions uh, already that have been posted. Um, please do post uh, your questions on the tab. Um, so let me start with the first one. Uh, Abdul Rahman Sattar asks, uh, does SDN mean that the existing protocols like BGP, OSPF, et cetera, will go away? Ah, that's a fabulous uh, question. In, in fact, not necessarily, and in early deployments, it didn't. Uh, in the RCP work, uh, we ran above the network, but we still ran the distributed protocols underneath, in part because that way we only had to do programmability for the parts of the traffic we needed that capability for, and in part because, you know, this was a research prototype. If it failed, we didn't want the network to collapse. And Google's early deployments of SDN worked the same way. They didn't have, uh, they didn't take away the legacy protocols. Uh, I think there's also an importance to have some way of bootstrapping communication with the controller. So there has to be, even in the end state, some distributed protocol to enable communication with the controller. And so I don't think the legacy protocols may go away to be replaced by ones designed for that purpose. But certainly in the, in the short term, they've been used heavily. And even in the long term, there's some need for, for distributed protocols to help bootstrap. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ashutosh asks, uh, what are typical security issues for uh, OpenFlow for northbound and southbound APIs? Ah, that's a great question. <laughs> okay. so the use of a central controller and an open interface to the data plane at one level is good for security because it enables the collection of better data and the installing of rules to block unwanted traffic. So it's an opportunity for security. At the same time, there are new risks. In particular, the overloading of the controller or bugs in the programs written in the controller. And both are a concern. Uh, on the plus side, the controller doesn't need to be globally accessible. It's not a, it's not as difficult a problem to protect the controller as it is to say protect a website where the goal is to support arbitrary users contacting it. That said, um, worst case workloads that an adversary might generate could overload the controller and particularly if packets can be sent to the controller. And certainly bugs in the applications can be a concern as well. And so I didn't talk a lot about this, but verification um, of the software and verification of the compiler are really important. And that's a, that been a, a bigger focus in my own work recently is to, to make sure that we have verified comp compilation technology for P4 and ways to verify P4 programs. Uh, and part of that is because of the security risks of, of bugs in those programs. So still an active area. I don't think they're good answers yet. Okay, thanks. Uh, Rajiv Shore asks, it's a sort of kind of related question, but will enhanced programmability likely result in increased network vulnerability? Yeah, I think that is a similar question. I, my hope is no, because the extra programmability gives us, well, first of all, I hope we can do domain specific verification. I think verifying software is obviously a grand challenge problem in, in computing, but these domain specific languages are quite constrained. I mean, they're not remotely Turing complete. And so I'm more optimistic that uh, verification technology can be brought to bear on data plane programs in ways that it might be more difficult for control plane programs. And I'm also hopeful that as we build better abstractions, that we can use compilers to translate from high level intent down to even the control plane programs. So we're not there yet, but I think the, the domain being more constrained and the programmability being more constrained give me hope that these technologies, which are, are really ready for prime time in a way they weren't when I was in grad school. At the time, you, could you couldn't barely verify a three or four line program uh, you know, in, in the early 90s. Now these technologies are widely used and are, are really much more mature. So I'm uh, certainly by no means done, but I'm optimistic that the trend is our friend here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Rajiv has another question. He asks, where do you think internet is heading over the next five to 10 years? Any thoughts on the evolution? <laughs> 
Oh, wow. These are all great questions. I, I have two thoughts there. Uh, and they're, they're both probably pretty obvious points, but I think they're, they're interesting. One is we, you know, the internet was supposed to be this great democratizing equalizer, you know, tens of thousands of autonomous systems connecting at will to one another. But what we really have now are a small number of companies that are in large control over major parts of internet traffic, you know, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, and so on. That's not necessarily a bad thing. That's an opportunity to rethink the way the network works. Most traffic now goes you know, directly from the content or cloud provider to the eyeball. And so it's a nice opportunity, I think, to ease incremental deployment of new ideas, uh, particularly those related to security, because we don't have to get so much global agreement to get things done. There's a smaller number of players and a smaller number of hops that you have to go through to get things done. On the flip side, it raises its own set of risks around robustness and privacy. And so I think there are, I think figuring out how to think about if we'd known the internet was going to have so much industry consolidation and when it was designed, it might have been designed a little differently with that in mind. And so I think there's a nice opportunity in the research community to think about the long, the end game of that taken to its extreme. What is, what does the internet look like? And, and I think closely related to that is the emergence of cellular networking and particularly 5G, uh, where we're now going to see a, a huge number of applications at the edge with the computation and content perhaps also at the edge. So now really everything, the network is, is, is collapsed almost, uh, which I think is an exciting, uh, exciting opportunity and yet raises new challenges because the applications that will use these networks will have really extreme latency, privacy, security requirements. And so I think all the problems we've worked on for years just went up a notch uh, when we think about them in that context. And so I'm excited to start learning. It's a space I don't know well. I think there's a, a gap between people who know mobile wireless networks and people who do network systems. And I think it's going to be an interesting challenge in our field to figure out how to bridge that gap. I'm, I confess I'm coming up the learning, learning curve, but it's slow going. So related to that, I had a I had a question. So does that mean that uh, you know the large uh, uh, ISPs should be concerned, given the uh, the growth of these cloud companies? Should the AT and T's be concerned uh, with this uh, situation in the future? I think so, because you know, as the content providers get closer to the eyeballs, the carriers in the middle become less and less relevant. They're there to reach the the part, the networks that aren't directly connected to Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and so on. And maybe that becomes a, a diminishing set of networks. And I think also the ease of putting up access networks, whether it's 5G, small cells, or whatever, mean that it's possible to start providing access network coverage without being a major carrier with a lot of real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that the real estate advantage that these carriers have is important. And we do see now you know, uh, companies collaborating like Microsoft and AT&T working together to do cellular uh, edge computing deployment, which I think is pretty exciting. So some of this, maybe they don't need to be quite so concerned if they collaborate with the companies that are um, that are providing edge compute. But I, I do think if they don't, there's some risk that they just get circumvented mm -hmm. because the traffic doesn't need to go through them. Okay. Meanwhile, another question is coming. Uh, Divakar Das asks, is there an emulation environment for P4 software and hardware to try on a desktop? Yes, yes. So a lot of the research in my group uses Mininet, uh, which was developed at Stanford for as a network emulation environment, not just for SDN, but in general. And then there's a behavioral model of P4 called BMV2, behavioral model version two. And so a lot of our work takes place in Mininet on a laptop uh, using uh, using those tools. I think I should mention that's hugely important. Uh, I mean, I wasn't involved in any of that work, but I'm really grateful it was done because it now means I can have an undergrad do a semester project where they, where they build a P4 app. And I've found a lot of early stage grad students or undergrad projects building these apps. It's first of all inspiring because the students can build something real and actually run it. And for me, it's been a way to explore a wide range of applications to learn by doing. Uh, with with a fairly low barrier to, to getting the knowledge that one gets from learning by doing. Uh, now it's also possible to, to buy and deploy commercial switches. And in the Princeton campus, we have a number of Barefoot Tofino switches running uh, in the campus network in an effort we call P4 Campus. If you go to p4campus.cs.princeton.edu, uh, you can see that. And we right now do passive data collection of live traffic and run our analytics applications on the real data in the Princeton campus network. Uh, something that's possible because we can buy an $8,000 switch uh, and, and readily deploy it and program it with P4. Okay. I have a Thank question, uh, Ranjita, I might Go ask. A rather long question I thought I'll ask directly. Um, sure. So, Jan, um, I used to work for at and you know, just like you, maybe a little less number of years, but um, I wanted to ask you, the classic paper you have all written about OpenFlow, right, uh, 2007 or 8, right? Mm -hmm. 
And then industry picked up operator community that picked up the whole SD and NMP concept or uh, around like 2013 or around that, like when they started talking HC, NMP, you know, all this stuff. Right. So it took almost like six to seven years. What do you think is the catalyst for the operator to think about this paradigm um, and how, how it translated, right, from a classic academic paper to real operator driven uh, solution? Yeah, great question. I think some of this is just the trends were in the air. So I wouldn't credit the paper with all of it. First of all, I think I think there one trend was the emergence of merchant silicon chipsets, so that it was possible for a large number of new vendors to enter the market, you know, NEC, HP, etc, people that were building servers for data centers now could build network equipment, because they had merchant silicon chipsets, and they were frankly willing to support open flow because they were trying to compete with the established vendors who were perhaps less enthusiastic about open flow. So I think I, w I wouldn't under understate the advantage of that. And I think the large cloud providers also, you know, people at Microsoft, Google, and so on, they write code very well. They, they, and the only part of the infrastructure they couldn't control was their network and their network is in the way. And this is quite infuriating, right? You have to buy expensive over-designed equipment that you can't program yourself and to do special purpose things that are different than what that equipment was built to do. And so I think the large cloud providers just really were, in, 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 they were just infuriated by the fact that they weren't allowed to program their network. And that was really, and I think whether they programmed that network centrally or distributedly was not the point. The openness ended up being the bigger point, I think, than, than whether it was centralized or, or, or distributed. So I would say the merchant silicon chipsets and the, the hyperscalers were the, were the main reason this, this took off. I have a relevant question if you if I ask um, this is a little bit related to open source community right uh, I know you talked about ONF uh, P4 um, and many of the operator community are embracing open source um, but there are pros and cons to that as well right um, so I think what do you see the evolution or deployment aspects of that is it rapidly going the open source is it helping it or impeding it yeah, I think I think that it's a double edged sword, like you said. I think what we should we should want are the commodity things that are not differentiating to be open source because everybody needs them, and nobody should have to build them themselves because it's not that interesting. So the lower layers of the stack hopefully are of that type. Just like you, know, you shouldn't have to build Linux, right? If if you're an end host uh, person, so I think similarly we want a network operating system that others can build on top of. And then companies should be able to build product differentiating applications on top that are proprietary, that they don't have to tell their vendor about. So ironically, the, the creation of an open source ecosystem below enables the evolution of a proprietary ecosystem above that wouldn't be possible if your vendor controlled, controlled the code below. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm not saying I would want everything to be proprietary. I'd love to have everything an academic. I'd love everything to be open source and available to everyone. But realistically, I think it's totally reasonable that companies who are trying to make money would have product differentiating uh, applications on top that they don't share uh, on top of the open source. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one more question's come in, uh, Jen, from Mukulika Maiti, uh, IIIT Delhi. Uh, how much programmability, uh, how how much has programmability evolved in wireless networks, specifically in Wi-Fi networks? Wow. I don't know if I can answer that question very well because I'm still coming up the wireless learning curve. I mean, certainly a lot of enterprise Wi-Fi systems have central control over access points. So a lot of the access points are thin and the, and the controllers are doing a lot of the work to figure out signal strength, antenna direction, channel setting, and, and so on. So I do think there's a fair amount of programmability there. But I don't know that I have enough insight, even in the cellular space where I'm trying to learn. Uh, maybe we should have uh, Ashutosh answer this one. <laughs> you probably know better, better than I. I don't, I don't really have a good understanding of uh, the cellular uh, physical layer space yet. I think for the sake of discussion, ITF has been um, developing. Jen, you might probably know that a few years back, I came across how to control the access points from central controller, as you just pointed out. Um, CapWap, Watson Group, I think they're doing something on that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had a question. I mean, do you see software uh, again uh, for these switches in the future instead of being explicitly programmed, uh, being machine learned? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I, I think perhaps, although I would, I would be a little skeptical about how sophisticated the machine learning algorithms are that can run in the data plane. Uh, when I talk to my, my ML colleagues and I tell them that a P4 switch can't do multiplication or division, 
and they'd look at me like I have two heads. They're like, what? <laughs> you know? so, uh, and you can't do a, a tremendous amount of concurrent processing on a packet. You can do some, but it's it's quite limited. So I think it's perhaps more promising to, to identify the features in, you know, in a more offline way and collect the features in the data plane and perhaps do more of the learning, uh, the actual learning offline. Uh, I know there are people trying to see if more primitive ML learning techniques can actually be done in the data plane, and perhaps for some applications that's possible, but I don't know that it has to be that way. To take an example, video quality of experience depends on round trip time throughput, packet loss, and a handful of other features. The weights to put on those features to determine QOE can be learned outside the data plane. And those features I just mentioned are not hard to collect in the data plane and to, uh, to apply simple weighting to them or in or out of the data plane. Uh, wouldn't be so hard. So I think figuring out the right division of labor, being cognizant of that, that it's a fairly impoverished computational model in the data plane for all my all of my uh, raw rawness about programmability. The need for speed is it makes it a fairly challenging model to to work with. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Can I Jen. ask another question? Yeah, 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 sure. Go ahead. We yeah, uh, I, uh, uh, you know, have time, it's, right? It's, it's hard to get uh, Jen's yeah. uh, time, you know, and, and the whole world community will benefit from our answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jen, um, no, it is. It is true. Uh, the control loop, right? I know. I think you talked about control loop. And now we are getting into AI ML um, and this control loop can be, if you look at the whole 5G type, again, I'm getting into 5G, uh, please excuse me on that. Uh, <laughs> so you have the RAN network, it's cloud, you have core like end-to-end -end system, right? And you have this SDN controller, et cetera, the control loop orchestration. And people are thinking about where should I put the control loop? How do I get the quick, you know, there's a denial of service attack happening or performance overload. How quickly I detect and take the action, right? Um, you want to comment something on that, the placement of control loop at a different part of the network. Yeah, right? it's interesting you ask that because I'm working on a project right now called Pronto with, with Stanford and Cornell and the Open Networking Foundation on, on uh, just verifiable closed loop control, particularly of 5G. And there we're looking, we're looking at exactly these questions. I don't know that we have answers yet, but we're looking particularly at drone, drone applications and figuring out, you know, what do we have to do to say block a cyber attack? from interfering with the drone's own control loop, right? Because the drone has this very tight control loop to do observation and, and positioning. And so we're looking at, gee, can we, if we detect the DOS attack in the data plane, do we have time to correct it through the control plane or do we actually need to do uh, blocking directly in the data plane? So we're, you know, depending on the sophistication of the attack and how quickly we have to respond to it, we might want to do that directly all on the data plane just because of the, the, the time to time scale that would take to go to the control plane to implement the loop might be might be too tight. Thank you. Uh, I, there's another question that's come up, uh, but I think you maybe might have answered a bit of it in the last answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Abdul Rahman Sattar asks, as a follow up to the ML question that was asked, why would you want to do ML in data plane at all? Wouldn't the ML happen offline and the control plane can then program the routes in the switches? So I think pragmatically that might be necessary because of the computational limitations I mentioned, although conditions change quickly, particularly when adversarial behavior is happening. And so I think part of the motivation for the question is that, that you don't necessarily want to do learning offline if conditions uh, deviate from, from what, what you did the training on. So I do think it would be useful if one could do that, the learning in the data plane. I'm just skeptical. At least I'm skeptical that the kind of data planes we have now are, are well built for that. It's possible that we'll later have a domain specific processor that has a better balance. I mean, these, these devices are still really focused on packet processing and packet forwarding, not, not on learning. But that doesn't mean we couldn't have a, do, a new design that was, was better suited to doing a mix of the two. And that may, maybe that will evolve because it needs to be done in the data plane. So I think it's a, it's a fun question to think about. What I love about all these questions is we used to put functionality where we could, and now we have to, now we have to ask the hard question of where should we put it? And I have to be honest, I haven't really thought about those questions until recently because I've always been like, oh, I can only put it here, so I will. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's like I can put it multiple places and I don't have a good science to tell me where to put them. And, and maybe maybe over time we'll we'll get better at, at at being able to reason about that in a rigorous way, but I don't think we're there yet. Okay, thanks, Jen. The last call for questions. Any more questions? No. 
Three, two, one. I, okay. I have a question. Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 this is right? I think, again, this is a, on the test bed side, right? I, in one of your slides, I think, talked about, and I love test beds because, you know, at the end of the day, you have to have something experimental, you know, do things. Um, so you said uh, test bed, uh, there's a P4 test bed in Princeton? Yeah. That, so people like to play around, you know, how do we, how do we get in? I mean, is it NSF funded or? How, how so, so the test bed at Princeton we have is more internal. So we have two things at Princeton right now. One called P4 Campus, which is a pass monitoring the traffic on the campus network and feeding the taps to our programmable switches for us to run experiments. So it's harder to share. You know, we've sometimes run experiments on behalf of others, but it's not easy to provide access because we're looking at the, the actual user, you know, camp, campus user traffic. The second is we're deploying the ONF Ether platform, which is a oh. cellular uh, edge computing combo test bed where we have a couple of small cells in my lab coupled with programmable switches and the, uh, the ONF software stack. And that we're doing, you know, sort of more controlled experiments in the lab. And literally that got turned on in my lab like three days ago. So, I mean, it's, you know, we haven't, I mean, the students aren't even back in the office yet. Just the equipment is talking to itself right now. Managed to bring ONAP under control? <laughs> What's that? You managed to bring ONAP under control or you're using a lightweight person? <laughs> But but I'm hoping that that yeah. lets us make it real with some applications that actually have the have, again have control loops of their own like yeah. like uh, like a drone word, uh, and I, I think in both cases I would encourage other people at, at other schools to do deployments. I know there are several, including uh, in in some of the schools in India, of, of networking test beds that you can deploy on your campus. I mean we're all fortunate to be users of a network. Uh, directly where we work uh, normally when we're not working at home. Uh, and, and so there's a real opportunity, I think, for people to deploy and experiment in their own labs. You don't have to be a hyperscaler to be able to do experimental networking research. I mean, obviously it helps, but uh, there's also opportunities in the enterprise and the edge that we can explore locally. Thank you very much. That's all, Ranjita. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, just, I just posted a comment saying, you know, uh, if anybody has any questions, please don't feel shy to ask them just because I did a countdown. Um, but I think that, that's, that, yeah, uh, people have stopped posting um, questions. So let me just share my screen one last time, Jen. Let's hope this works. Uh, yeah, so, um, so we have this plaque that we've gotten made and we're going to ship it to you. But since we can't give it to you physically right now, we thought we'd just share uh, what it looks like. Um, thank you so thank much you. for this uh, amazing, amazing talk. Um, and I'm sure it's uh, a lot of people, including myself, uh, are really inspired. And I think I'll take some ideas from it as well. Uh, thank you again, uh, Jen for uh, really, really uh, a great last hour or so. Thanks so much, Rangita. Thanks for hosting me. Thanks. Thank you. Stay well, everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye. All right. That was great, Jen. Thanks. Thanks again. Oh, pleasure. Thank you. It was good yeah, for you. Very, very nice to yeah. Thank you. Great questions. Right. Bye. 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 Okay. Yeah. Take care. Bye. See you later.